Welcome to the Natural Super Kids Podcast, where you will discover practical strategies to inspire you to boost the health and nutrition of your kids. I'm Jessica Donovan, a qualified naturopath specializing in kids' health, and I want to make it as easy as possible for you to raise healthy and happy kids. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome back to the Natural Super Kids podcast. Today I am going to be starting a two-part episode all about celiac disease. I cannot believe we haven't covered this on the podcast yet. Um, So in this first episode, I want to talk more about the prevalence, what celiac disease is, the signs and symptoms, and the testing and diagnosis. So we get a lot of questions um, about the diagnosis and testing and because it is quite confusing there's sort of three parts to it so we're going to dive into that but first let's talk a bit about what celiac disease is um, and some of the common signs and symptoms so celiac disease it's a serious condition that affects the gut um, but it is known as an autoimmune disease so it occurs in genetically predisposed people and we're going to get to that genetic testing and how that fits into the diagnosis a bit later on so what happens in celiac disease is when gluten is eaten or ingested it leads to damage in the small intestine um, and can lead to a really big variety. There's a really huge variation in terms of signs and symptoms. So it often goes undiagnosed. Um, yeah, which is a, a bit of a problem. And here at Natural Super Kids, I mean, we have kind of encouraged multiple people to get their kids tested or get themselves tested for celiac disease. And they have been completely surprised that it has come back positive. So, you know, I think we think of this you know, quite serious digestive um, disease being it, it being like really obvious if we were to have it or our child was to have it, but that really is not the case. And so um, celiac disease, it's estimated to affect about one in a hundred people worldwide, but only about 30% of people are properly diagnosed. And that, um, you know, th- those numbers go up if you have a um, you know, a family history of, of celiac. So people with first degree relatives that have celiac disease, so that's either a parent, a child or a sibling have a one in 10 risk of developing celiac disease. So you can see how, you know, there's that really strong genetic link. It is hereditary. Um, it does run in families. So if you're listening to this and you have a, you know, a um, immediate or first degree relative with celiac disease, you know, this is especially applicable to you. Even if celiac disease isn't the full kind of presentation of the disease hasn't developed, it doesn't mean that it won't later on as well. So you've got to be really, um, I guess, aware if you do have Um, that genetic predisposition to celiac disease. Let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms, because I think this is where people can get, you know, really tripped up. As I said, you feel like it, you know, it it seems like it should be obvious, um, uh, but it's not always obvious. And that is because, you know, it um, affects different people differently. And there are more than 200 known celiac disease symptoms um, and they're not all digestive or gut related either. Um, And the symptoms for children can be quite different to symptoms for, for, for adults as well. The other thing to make it even more confusing is that some people with celiac disease don't have any symptoms at all, but still test positive. Um, And, you know, others might have negative test results, um, but might have like blood test results, but might have a positive intestinal biopsy. Um, So, you know, there's it it can be really tricky um, to get your head around all of this. So let's talk about some of the common signs and symptoms in children specifically. Um, And a lot of these are translatable to adults as well. But digestive symptoms, interestingly, are more common 
in infants and children with celiac disease. So, you know, the first really obvious one is abdominal bloating and pain, um, chronic diarrhea, constipation. Uh, these are some of the really common, you know, more digestive related symptoms, nausea and vomiting, pale, foul smelling stools. Um, so these are all really common symptoms in children. But also on the list of common symptoms in children are things like anxiety, depression, um, really interestingly, ADHD and learning disabilities. Um, there are things like damage to tooth enamel. So, you know, dental issues, delayed puberty, failure to thrive, fatigue is a big one, headaches, um, iron deficiency, anemia, um, is big as well. So when there's unexplained iron deficiency that just doesn't seem to resolve, no matter what we're doing, um, you know, celiac disease is definitely a consideration. Things like irritability, um, lack of muscle coordination, uh, weight loss, a short stature are all symptoms, signs and symptoms of, of celiac disease. But of course, these signs and symptoms alone do not mean that you have celiac disease. So this is why it you know, can be quite tricky. Things like easy bruising, um, recurrent mouth ulcers uh, and swelling of the mouth and tongue, skin rashes um, such as dermatitis, altered mental alertness, um, especially after eating gluten-containing foods, bone and joint pain, um uh yeah some of the more common signs and symptoms of celiac disease particularly in children as i said though there are you know well over 200 so you can see why it can be tricky to kind of pinpoint this as being the problem um and to get a proper diagnosis so when it comes to testing and the diagnosis of celiac disease there are sort of three parts and not everyone needs to have all of these tests done, but it's the combination of the results of these tests that can lead to the official diagnosis of celiac disease. So um, before I start to talk about that, in terms of screening, obviously, like if you're um, if your child or yourself has, you know, some of those signs and symptoms of celiac disease, it can be a really good idea to get tested. Generally, testing happens in children older than three. Um, testing is not generally done um, on children younger than three. Um, it's a good idea to get some testing done if you do have a first degree relative, a parent, a sibling, um, or a child with celiac disease uh, and also associated autoimmune conditions so other autoimmune conditions that can um, increase your chances um, or make you more susceptible to celiac disease uh, so things like type 1 diabetes autoimmune thyroid um, disease so things like Hashimoto's autoimmune liver disease um, Down syndrome, and there's a few other sort of more rare syndromes, Turner syndrome, Williams syndrome, um, where testing is generally warranted. Um, yeah, and interestingly, like in terms of kids that are younger than three, it's um, in children that are younger than three and they have symptoms, the antibody testing uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, may not always be accurate. And that's because children must be eating wheat or barley-based cereals, so gluten-containing grains, for some time, up to a year, before they can generate an autoimmune response to gluten that shows up in testing. So, you know, a pediatric gastroenterologist is who you would want to see in terms of getting evaluated when it comes to, to young children. So young children, for example, that are failing to thrive or have persistent diarrhea um, are often sort of flagged for celiac disease. And yeah, the, the, a pediatric gastroenterologist can, um, you know, help. So... That, as I said, there's three parts to the testing. 
And this can cause a lot of confusion in terms of why do I need to have, you know, all these different tests and why is um, has this test has come back positive, but, um, you know, the diagnosis is not confirmed. So the first part when it comes to testing is the genetic testing. So to, um, you know, to, to develop celiac disease, there are some genes that um, are, you know, necessary for you to, to develop celiac disease. So um, if you have these genes, though, it doesn't mean you necessarily have celiac disease, but the genetic testing can be really helpful for ruling out celiac disease. So if you have genetic testing um, and the gene test for, for celiac disease is called HLA-DQ2, um, and then there's HLA-DQ8. So at least one of these genes is necessary for celiac disease to develop. Um, but as I said, they're present. Just having these genes does not mean that a person has celiac disease or will ever get celiac disease. It just makes it, um, you know, possible that they could potentially get celiac disease at some point in their lifetime. So the genetic test is most useful for ruling out celiac disease, because if you get a negative gene test, so you don't have either of these genes, it means that celiac disease can be excluded. Um, a positive gene test, so if you do have one of these genes, indicates that you are susceptible to celiac disease, but it does not diagnose celiac disease on its own. The good thing with genetic testing is, you know, it can be done via blood test or it can be done via cheek scraping. So it can be fairly non-invasive for children. Um, and as I said, it's most helpful to, to be able to rule it out. So if you if your child has the gene testing for celiac and it comes back positive, the next step would be um, a blood test. And this is what we know as celiac serology. So this is measuring antibodies, certain antibodies in the blood, um, which can again indicate whether celiac disease is present or not. Now, there's a few things to note when it comes to celiac serology in children. Um, one is that these antibodies that this blood test is testing for, they, they can, so the testing can be less sensitive in children. So it's really important that the doctor requests a combination of these antibody tests rather than just one alone. Um, and, you know, most GPs uh, will be, you know, very aware of this. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a range of different tests that you can get done that are basically looking for levels of antibodies that the body is producing in response to gluten. So the other tricky thing here, though, is that gluten must be in the diet for these tests to be accurate. So if you're not, if your child isn't eating gluten, then, and, and they get an, an antibody test or a celiac serology test done, it may come back negative, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have celiac disease. So these tests are only reliable if your child is regularly consuming gluten. So if gluten has been removed from the diet for more than, say, six weeks around that sort of period of time prior to the test, um, the blood test and also the small bowel biopsy, which I'll talk about in a moment, may be inaccurate or hard to interpret. So this is where the tricky part comes in because um, you know, a lot of parents will remove gluten from the diet knowing that it's having an impact on their child. And then when they're wanting to kind of um, look into celiac disease and get testing and a diagnosis, um, it's often recommended that they start eating gluten again, which can be really hard if you know your child doesn't do well on gluten. But it is the only way to get a definitive diagnosis for celiac disease is to have gluten in the diet for a period of about six weeks. So this is really important to note because if you are considering removing gluten from your child's diet to see, you know, if they fare better without gluten in their diet, whether that's because of celiac disease or um, potentially a gluten sensitivity or a gluten allergy, then you really want to make sure you get some testing done first before you remove it from the diet to prevent having to 
do a gluten challenge um, and reintroduce it into the diet. Um, and so the other thing to note is that a gluten challenge is often discouraged in children that are under the age of five um, or during like puberty growth spurt sort of phase because of the potential negative effects that gluten can have on a child with celiac disease on their growth and development. So a discussion with your doctor, your pediatric gastroenterologist is really important if your kids fit into those you know, either of those kind of age brackets under five or going through puberty before you look at doing a gluten challenge. And this can be a really hard decision for parents. This is often we get questions about this, like I've been recommended to do a gluten challenge so we can test for celiac. You know, I know my child does not do well on on gluten. What do I do? And really, this is a very individual decision. Um, but what you need to know is to get a confirmation of celiac disease and a, a, a confirmed diagnosis, you need to get at this testing done while your child is eating gluten and they need to have been had gluten in their diet regularly for, uh, you know, around the six week mark. So the next step in testing is, um, is a intestinal biopsy. So this goes ahead if um, the celiac serology test results, those antibodies are, you know, are found within the blood. Um, and so that on its own, even so with the genetic testing and the celiac serology, the antibody testing, even those two things together are not a confirmed diagnosis of, of celiac disease. So the intestinal biopsy is kind of that final step and where the diagnosis of celiac disease is made. Um, this is done by a gastroenterologist. Um, and, you know, for kids, we're, we're talking about a pediatric gastroenterologist that would do an intestinal biopsy. So this is done via um, an endoscopy and, and um, a tiny sample of the small bowel is collected and, um, and that is when, you know, the, the diagnosis is either confirmed or, or denied. Um, so this test is basically you know, the, the biopsy is determining whether there's been some damage done to the small bowel. And this is what happens in celiac disease with exposure or ingestion of gluten. The immune response leads to damage um, of the tissue of the small bowel. And so this, um, this intestinal biopsy is what confirms that. Uh, the intestinal biopsy is also really helpful to exclude other, you know, issues or diagnoses that that may be going on that may be causing, you know, the same symptoms. So, um, and it also is helpful for understanding the degree of damage that's been done to the small bowel um, in terms of, uh, you know, follow up care and rebuilding work that needs to be done on the gut. So we've got the gene testing, we've got the serology, which is the antibody testing, and then we've got that final step, which is the intestinal biopsy. So it's quite a process uh, to get that, you know, final diagnosis of celiac disease. And once that diagnosis has been made, obviously that means that, you know, that's a that's a forever disease. We need to be avoiding gluten strictly. Um, for the rest of that child or that adult's life because gluten is causing, you know, that, that immune response um, that's causing damage to the bowel. And that can lead to, you know, so many issues in terms of absorbability of nutrients um, happening through, through that bowel wall. So really important that gluten is um, very strictly avoided in anyone that has celiac disease. And I think that's, that's a pretty, um, you know, pretty, I guess, common knowledge. So I think this is a really important topic to talk about, especially in light of the fact that only 20 to 30% of people with celiac disease are actually diagnosed. So there's a lot of undiagnosed people um, walking around out there. And if we can start to be aware of this in children, in our children, particularly if we've got that family history of celiac disease, 
um, you know, the, the genetic test can be super helpful in terms of especially ruling out celiac or whether that particular child is going to be likely to develop celiac disease any time in their lifetime. Um, I do also want to mention that the intestinal biopsy can sometimes be avoided um, in children but that is sort of um, up to the pediatric gastroenterologist that you might be seeing. Um, and there are certain kind of, um, I guess, guidelines in terms of antibody levels, I think need to be more than 10 times the upper limit of normal. And there's a few other sort of um, signs and symptoms that, um, as well as that um, you know, positive genetic test where you can potentially avoid the intestinal biopsy because that's not, you know, a, a necessarily a pleasant um, procedure on children. Um, but that is up to your medical professional. But that's always worth talking about. Um, but the gold standard, I guess, for that, you know, um, confirmation of diagnosis is that intestinal biopsy. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that for this episode. In the next episode, I'm going to talk more about a holistic approach to celiac disease. Obviously, we, we you know, if, if celiac disease is confirmed, we need to be avoiding gluten strictly. But what else can we be doing, especially because by the time celiac disease is diagnosed, often there's been quite a bit of damage to the gut. And look, this is not often something that uh, medical professionals are talking about it's like okay you've got to remove gluten and get on with your life um, you know over time the gut will heal the damage that's been done but we that you know we know that a lot of people that are diagnosed with celiac disease continue to live with digestive symptoms and other symptoms like fatigue um, you know ongoing even after they remove gluten from their diet. So really important to be looking at this holistically. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next episode. I hope this has been helpful. Please share this episode with um, anyone you think can benefit from this information. And I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Head on over to our website, naturalsuperkids.com for the show notes for this episode, as well as a whole heap of inspiration to help you raise healthy and happy kids. I'll see you next week.